I was having flashbacks to my first Newsboys performances. And I th- is it Phil Joel with the long hair? I can't remember. I think, David, you should add your hair down on that last song <laughs> and just really got into it. That was... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, today is a big day. Uh, we have been going through Joseph's life all summer, and it comes to a close today. So open up to Genesis chapter 50 for the great conclusion of our sermon series end, the story of Joseph. Last week, Joseph's father, Jacob, passed away, and we learned about that in chapter 49. And now in Genesis chapter 50, we'll pick things up at verse 15. There's verses 1 through 14 are good. Uh, just, they have more information than we need in today's message. So if you are curious, read through those this week. If the sermon's not your flavor, you can even read through them after, you know, halfway through the sermon if you want to. Just kidding. Uh, hope, and just, yeah. Here we go. Uh, so let's read uh, chapter 50, verse 15 in Genesis. We'll pick things up right here. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to him, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive, and they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for the the man that Joseph was, and we thank you, Lord, for being worked, being tethered to him, being just entwined with his life. Lord, we are so grateful. We're grateful to be in the body of Christ. Be grateful to be in your presence here today. Would you give us ears to hear? Would you open our ears, God? Would you give us faith to believe what you need us to hear and believe today? And we pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Now, before we get into Genesis 50, I'll ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. I, I feel that... Um, These two sections of Scripture, what we hear in Genesis 50, and then what we read in 1 Corinthians are are really tied together. What it says here in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part... Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. For now we see in a mirror dimly. I want to start today by stating the obvious, the often forgotten obvious. We do not know everything. We do not get to know everything. And we do not see everything because God does not let us see everything. And this is incredibly frustrating for us as humans, isn't it? So frustrating. Our desire for this ties back to the fall, I suppose. We wanted to be like God then and we still do now. We want to be in control. We like to be able to see it all clearly. But scripture tells us today the truth. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. Now, just in part. And I'm sure this is a blessing. I've already have a hard time dealing with that in which I do see on a day-to-day basis. It's hard to deal with what I see online and in the news And if that is happening in the open, I cannot imagine what is happening in the dark, in the areas where no cameras are present, or even deeper still, I can't imagine what's happening in people's hearts, the evil that resides there. And and even deeper than that, I cannot imagine if we were able to see the spirit in the spiritual realms and the evil and the battle that's taking place even now. But we don't see all that. And although we only see dimly, we have a God that sees all. A God that chooses to stay present and pursue a human race in spite of seeing the evil and the damage that we do. 
Throughout this sermon series of Joseph, there's one thing that stands out. As special as a man that Joseph is, he's not the hero of this story. In the closing chapter of Genesis and in the closing of Joseph's appearance in the Bible, he points to the real hero. It's a God, real shocker. Our God, Jesus, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit is the hero in this story. Joseph knew this, that, that Jesus, that God was the, the hero over his life, that God was everywhere and Joseph saw God everywhere. This is how Joseph could respond the way that he does after all that happened to him. Look how Joseph says it. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Now, both, of, both sides of that statement are true. You meant evil against me. What the brothers had done, when, done was indeed evil. Joseph doesn't sugarcoat that truth. They are 100% responsible for their sins, and their sins were definitely evil. But God meant it for good. This doesn't mean that evil isn't evil. It just means that God is able to take the actions of sinful men and use them to accomplish his plans. Joseph saw the invisible hand of God at work over his life. And I just, I, I just want to pause here, and I've said it once, but I just want to make sure this is really clear. This doesn't take away from the evil of the events in Joseph's life, and this doesn't take away from the evil and the hard things in your past. This doesn't mean they were, they were good things. I'm not saying here that we just need to change our perspective of those bad things, uh, that things that hurt you, uh, and we can just become unsympathetic towards it because it's like, yeah, it's no big deal. God just, it's, it's all going to be good in the end anyway. Who cares? No, that's not what I'm saying. The things that have hurt you in the past, those hard things in the past, the evil that you've experienced, those are evil and bad and wrong. Absolutely. I don't want to minimize that pain that you've experienced. I don't want to minimize maybe the pain that you've caused in the past. And Joseph doesn't do that here either. His brother's sins were big. Joseph just sees that God is bigger. Brother's sin was terrible and gross and deceitful, slimy. There was nothing good about it, but God still wanted and was able to use it to bring about his good plans and purposes. I mean, don't we serve an awesome God? He understood that behind his conniving brothers stood the Lord God who uses that entire affair in order to get him in just the right place at just the right moment in order to save his whole family and many others. Just like in in the garden, God lets our free will get us into trouble sometimes. Our choices can cause evil and really cause hurt, but God stands outside of that, stands over and outside of it, and has the ability to use it. Joseph is saying, though your motives were bad, God's motives were were good. Though it took years and years for God's purposes and plans to be clear, in the end, Joseph saw the hand of God behind everything that had happened. I mean, you think about how God was orchestrating, or, or maybe not orchestrating, but using the events of, of, of Joseph's life. I mean, God, God used the evil event of his brothers, throwing him into the cistern, and at just the right moments, had Midianites came along and to buy him. And at just the right moment, he was sold to Potiphar. And then God used the evil situation of Potiphar's wife falsely accusing him to put him in jail, where at just the right time, he met a baker and, and a cupbearer. And at just the right time, the cupbearer then remembered Joseph and and Pharaoh called for him. And at just the right moment, he was promoted in Egypt. And then he was used to save many lives, his own family's lives, where they could settle in the land of Goshen and where they prospered. So we, we have a God that is control, that is in control the entire time who is being the hero over this part of human history, making all things work for him and for the completion of his perfect will. And to just this, this should give us hope. We have a God that is in control. We can have a God that can use both the good in this world and use the evil in this world. And God is over your life and in control of your life the entire time, being a hero over your piece of human history and over this time in human history. 
Evil is not a moment where we should be doubting if God is present or if he ex- actually exists. Evil is, when evil happens, we as Christians should respond by, of course, having our hearts hurt for those whose evils be done, but pondering, as Christians, pondering during evil how our great God is going to turn this into something good for his children and for his plans. And this is not just for the evil in the world, but I just remind you again, this is for the evil we see in our own lives. The evil done to us. We have a God that is turning these things, working on these things for our benefit, for the church's good. We do not need to fear. I want us to be able to celebrate and praise him for this today. That as he battles for us in this world and as he battles for us in the spiritual realms that we don't even get a glimpse into, that we have victory and that even when there's evil in this world, even when we're hurt and harmed by it, we can rest that we have a God that can use it, that is outside of it and is giving us victory in advance. In this world, there will be trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus lays this out so beautifully and perfect for us in John 16. Now, this is good news. But I will admit that evil and its existence in this world is kind of confusing. Evil and why it exists can lead to so many questions. It's really kind of hard to grasp. And I would argue it should be. Because we only see dimly right now. Now we only see in part. As many of you know, Erica and I have uh, two boys. My oldest boy is uh, Sawyer. He's uh, working through his threes. (laughs) And uh, Sawyer asks a lot of why questions. He's trying to learn. It's helpful to him if everything has an explanation or a reason. He wants to know why the joke was funny so he can replicate it time and time again. He wants to know why he can't stick his hand down the badger hole while we're out walking in the woods. These questions aren't bad questions. They're a little repetitious, I have to admit. But they're not bad. But there always comes a time when the explanation I have for Sawyer is just bigger than he can grasp. I could spend all the time in the world describing why, but he probably just wouldn't get it. Or it would just lead to an endless supply of more and more whys and we would be there forever. So there's a time when I have to, as I talk with Sawyer and give him instruction or direction and he says why, I have to give the age-old response, because I said so. (laughs) This is never satisfying, is it? Remember back to when you were a child. If a parent said this, this was like an unfair trump card. It's just never satisfying. As a kid, what I thought this meant was the conversation's over. But really, what I've learned is when I tell Sawyer this, what I often mean by that comment is, Sawyer, trust me. And this is what I mean. Because I said so means, son, just just trust me. Trust there is a reason, but we have not the time, nor do you have the understanding for it. Because, so right now you're only seeing a mirror dimly. You see just in part. Now one day, son, one day you will see. One day you will understand. But that's not today. Today I, I need you to trust me. This can be very hard to be okay with as children of God. We think we're pretty smart. That if you would just give us a more complex answer, we would understand and be okay with it. This is hard for Sawyer at times, but what I hope is that my actions as a father give me me the, the ability to say this and be trusted. I hope that my sons know that, you know, Dad's always really trying to keep me safe. He's not trying to harm me. He's not trying to keep withhold something from me. He's this is probably for my good. Because He's pretty good. And our Heavenly Father thinks of the same way that he hopes that his actions, that his, his, his Bible, this book, this, this history of his faithfulness, his track record of always being faithful and good to his people 
shows you that you can trust him, even in that which we don't understand. Even when evil in this world is confusing and we feel like, how could you ever use this, Father? This doesn't make any sense. Why, God? And he says, trust me, you don't see everything. We have a God that has a track record in Scripture that continually shows us that he can take what people meant for evil and, and use it for good in his plan. Can this be seen any clearer than the cross? What men meant for evil, God meant for good? When life is hard, when evil seems to prevail, and when we start asking why, God says to maybe you this morning, trust me, you only see dimly. There's a lot more going on here than you understand. God says, remember, I will provide for you. I promise to be with you, to never leave you. I've sacrificed my own son for your benefit. Remember my track record. Have I ever done you wrong? Just trust me. I know this is confusing. I know this seems it's like it's, it's very under, like ununderstandable. But trust me. And this is what we see Joseph do time and time again throughout Genesis. Trusting God, letting God be the hero of the story. This is what made this whole sermon series so refreshing to me. Throughout the many stages of Joseph's life, he just seems to be focused on one thing. And that's just how he can be best used in his present place for God's glory. It seems like this made Joseph incredibly efficient and wise. We don't see Joseph spending a lot of time trying to make sense of his circumstances. We don't get to see him asking why. I, 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 it almost seems like he doesn't. When he goes from place to place, he just is so efficient and so, uh, so just incredibly useful that they just give him higher positions. He just seems to be focused on what he can do in the moment and he's present and he just works for the glory of God and we see it just work out. And when even those good works cause him trouble, like in Potiphar's household, he doesn't shake his fist at God and say, God, I was doing my part. How come you didn't do yours? No, oh, I guess I just have to be the best prisoner I can be now. Joseph seemed to already know what the Apostle Paul told the church 1,800 years later, that I only see in part. I don't know why things are happening. But he trusts God and he tries to honor God in the situations he is. While he is, in a, is, a, is a slave in Potiphar, Potiphar's house, he honors God. When Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, he trusts and honors God. In prison, he honors God. They, left, they lift him to a high position. He honors God. He trusts and honors God in the interpretations of the dreams. And he trusts and honors God as he approaches Pharaoh every step of the way. He's just concerned with how he can be faithful in that moment. He doesn't seem overly concerned with his past, not trying to make sense of it. He just sees the needs of the presence, present and tries to pursue the Lord and honor God there. Can you see how applicable this is for us today? Can you see how good God is today? With Joseph, we see a man more concerned with how to be used presently than just the wrong in his past. A man not focused on the evil in the world and being overwhelmed by it, but just focused on how to honor God, trusting that God can and will use it. And church, this is the type of relationship that I really feel the Heavenly Father desires for us, to be with him, trusting him, and to be used by him wherever we're at presently. Trusting that all that is behind us belongs to Christ, can be used by Christ. Knowing that right now we only see dimly. And also knowing that there will be a day when we will see it all. There will be a day where we see clearly. There will be a day when we are with our Savior and our King. The same King that uses even evil in the world for his plans of good. So we've covered a lot in Joseph this summer. There's a lot more than we could have ever touched. But if you are here today and you're overwhelmed by your past, I just ask you to give it to Jesus. 
He wants to heal it. He wants to redeem it. He wants to restore it. In fact, he even wants to use it. He does not want you walking backwards in this life, looking of what was or could have been and missing out on all the blessings and the gifts that he has laying in front of you presently. And if you are here today and you say, I do trust God and I want to be used by God right now in the present, but I don't know exactly how to do that or what my place is here or if I have the gifts to do it, well, I invite you to come next week as we dive into our new sermon series, Essential Kingdom Workers. Because I guarantee you, you have an essential job in this community, in your family, and in this piece of the body of Christ where God wants to use you presently for his glory. Use all of you, your past, your present, and to prepare you for a beautiful future in relationship with him. Let's pray. God, I just pray over those in this room right now that maybe are looking backwards, that they're holding on to something in their past. Lord, we see in the story today, Joseph's brothers were still concerned with this thing that happened years ago. They were still carrying this baggage. Joseph was not concerned. He was looking forward how he could provide for them, how he could, how he could uh, earn their favor. Lord, would we just be a people that are, are desiring to trust you now, that you give faith to trust you now, to honor you now, to be used presently, Lord, that you could take our past, that you could use our past, Lord, and that you could even use the evil that we currently see happening in the world and use it to complete your plans and your desired purposes. God, you are above all things, you are outside all things, and you are a good God that we love, a good God that we can trust and a good God that is bigger than the circumstances of our past or our present. So use us, lead us, and help us give you the things that we ought not carry any longer. Amen.